Hi everybody. Uh, well, uh, welcome to the, um, the last in our current series of webinars, which is very sad, but today we've got a fantastic um, webinar for you. Um, we've got Simon uh, speaking on the circular economy of facades and we've got around 320 people set to join with us today, so it's clearly a very current and very pertinent topic. Um, before I kind of go into that, I'll kind of say a bit more. So I did say this is the last in our current series of webinars, but very excitingly, they've been so popular that we're actually kind of now extending the series. So um, watch your inbox for an email coming through at some stage fairly soon with a new series of webinars. And they're kind of more of an international kind of theme. So we're going to have one from our San Francisco office, potentially looking at how R&D is impacting on future trends. We've got somebody from our Paris office talking about um, exploring engineering and sculptures, which sounds really interesting. Um, Yan Chi from our Hong Kong office is actually kind of looking at the challenges of how to set up a new office. He did that not so long ago. And I think that'll be really helpful to kind of lots of people around the world. Um, and then more to come. We're kind of, uh, we're still looking into new topics. So bear with us on that one and, um, and look out for those. Um, to mention for this particular webinar, um, as you can see, there's a chat box down in one of the corners of your screen. Um, if you want to put any kind of um, questions in there, I think, as always, we've got some great, uh, great people saying hello from Toronto, from the Czech Republic. We've got Milford and Barcelona. Great. Sounds, uh, it's great to have you with us. Um, pop in your questions in there. Simon's going to take questions at the end of the, um, at the end of the um, at the presentation. Then um, all that's left to say, I think, is that um, once we've got those questions, I'll come back on and do that. Uh, this is going to be recorded and it'll be put back up onto our website um, where you can watch it again if you want to or pass it on to your friends because obviously it's going to be brilliant. And um, all of the other webinars that we've had in this current series have been uploaded to our website. So if you want to check those out, go to um, eocengineers.com uh, forward slash news and you can see them all there, which is very exciting. Um, I will now hand you over to Simon, who's been with us for about the last five years or so, and um, and before that worked for kind of specialist contractors for facades, so uh, he knows what he's talking about. So I will leave you in the very capable hands of Simon. Thanks very much, and I'll see you in a bit. Thanks, bye. Thanks, Kat. Hi, everyone. And um, yeah, huge thanks for coming out today. I know um, everyone's, everyone's busy, so it's really appreciated that you're coming to listen. So yeah, today we're going to talk about a little bit about the circular economy of facades. Um, really, I think I think this uh, has been quite a topic for quite a while actually, and it comes and goes with, um, with popularity. So um, I think quite hopeful that uh, in the current climate, everyone's thinking a little bit differently and, and, and interested in taking steps and doing things in a different way. So yeah, so here you've probably seen um, a number of our other webinars, which have kind of touched on all of our three areas of structures, glass and facades. Um, just so you're aware of where I'm coming from as I give this presentation, I, I started off life as a structural engineer, um, did a fair bit of work in glass, and then finally moved into facades. So I've, I've kind of touched a little bit on all of these areas. Um, so yeah. And yes, yeah, so I'm sure, um, as you remember, Kat's, Kat's uh, keen to encourage people um, going back and watching, watching our webinars. And, um, yeah, there's a lot of really interesting things um, that have come out in the last few weeks. Uh, I've certainly learned a lot. So, um, yeah, we, we, um, we, we suggest going back and watching some of those if you missed out on them. So, uh, yeah, we're talking about circular economy of facades. So we've got a few different concepts that we're, we're looking to merge together, really. So I thought I'd start just touching on what the anatomy of a facade is from our point of view. So when we look at a facade from our point of view, we're, we're looking at First of all, a system. So when we look at it from a distance, we can see that it's, it's made up of a skin, which is kind of resisting all of the all of the external environment and keeping the internal environment constrained and, and comfortable for people. So when we look at that, we're talking about curtain walling, which is predominantly glass systems, maybe precast concrete if it's quite solid, um, rain screen systems, which you typically see with metal panels um, or terracotta, and of course brickwork, which you see all across London. Going into each of those systems, there are a series of components or sub-assemblies that kind of get put together um, to make the final system. And, and you know, that could be metal framing, it could be insulating glass units, 
um, the terracotta panels that you see, or even the gaskets and the membranes that are sitting in the back that you don't see, but are very important for the function. And of course, each of those components is in turn made up of materials, and, and materials is really where we get to the nub of what we're talking about today, because you know, we're, we're looking at the circular economy. The circular economy is actually a very broad subject, and it touches on a lot of things. And I've tried to narrow it down um, to the kind of the, the subject of material scarcity, if you will, or, or looking after the materials that we have um, in the industry and in, in the built environment, and seeing how we can retain them for as long as possible at the highest possible value. So then so that's facades, so facades over there for a second. Then we're looking at um, linear and circular economies. And these are really two bookends on, on, on a scale, right? So we're not really purely in a linear economy. We, we, one hopes that we get to a circular economy, but we might not, and, and that's okay maybe. Um, so dealing with the linear economy, this is closer to where we are now. And it's this kind of concept of we take what we want, um, we make however we, we choose to, we make something out of, out of what we've taken, taken from the earth. We use it for a period of time, and then at the end, we kind of bundle it up and, and throw it away um, in a you know, landfill, typically, or somewhere else. And that's, that's fairly limiting, and it, it's also quite, quite mixed. So we tend to mix technological and biological nutrients, and we kind of, we, we, we're bundling them up and throwing them away together, which is also curious choice if you think about it, because they're obviously two very different kinds of um, nutrients kind of, kind of components, and, and they're one of the technical side takes an awful lot longer to decompose, for example, than the biological side, which is you know, very cyclical and, and in fact very circular in itself. Another typical thing of a linear economy is that you're tending to use energy from finite resources such as oil, or gas, um, again, taking from the earth what you need and using that. So then, Running over to a circular economy, the circular economy tries to keep everything looped. So it, it works much more like an ecosystem, um, which you may remember from, from high school biology, which um, where you're, you're keeping everything, in everything inside the loop and you're not really discarding it or allowing it to leave. Um, and you're always finding, whenever you have a waste product, it's always actually a food or, or a nutrient for something else, some other process. And the concept of the circular economy is kind of take, saying, okay, that, that works in biology, great, we know that. But maybe we need to do that in industry as well with technical components and have the same philosophy in order to keep, keep it as sustainable for as long as possible. And again, because the circular economy in itself is actually quite energy intensive. So we're talking a lot about energy at the moment and we're worrying a lot about embodied carbon, quite rightly. Um, but actually to move to a circular economy, you really do have to move over to renewable resources because you can't, you can't actually afford to to be using up finite resources because you'll run out one day. And, and you really need that energy to keep reprocessing things and to keep them in the loop and keep them working. And much the way nature does, I mean, you know, we have a nuclear fusion reactor sitting up there that passes over us um, once a day. And, and nature has kind of adjusted itself to use that very cleverly. And, and maybe we need to think of, of needing renewable sources to, uh, to do the same. So, Quite a few people have been looking at this, this subject for quite a while, actually. I think first, the first um, shoots of this idea came up in the 70s. I think the first time I came across it as a concept without thinking of it as a circular economy was probably about 12 years ago when I read um, Cradle to Cradle, which I think is a really good book. That I highly recommend to people. Um, and it really, yeah, it captures this idea um, of, of having things in loops and, and basically having what is waste is actually food and nutrient for something else. And in recent years, this has come, this has come more to the front, actually, through the work of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, who work, um, who work a lot with uh, McKinsey Center for Business and Environment, with Sun, and more recently with Arab as a knowledge partner when looking at the built environment. And a few years ago, they came up with these kind of six levers or six actions to kind of help us, help us see and help us... Um, help direct us to make choices which will naturally push us slowly towards a circular economy. And these are called resolve. So the first one being regenerate, where we're trying to regenerate nature's resources as best as possible and, and not, not take away from nature and, and not put toxic, um, toxic materials out there, but, but actually try and nurture it and try and make it better than it is today. Um, it's about sharing, which is, which is really about trying to 
doesn't make an obvious choice, but it's actually, uh, when we talk about maximize asset utilization, it's really trying to say we can make products last for longer. And in that way, they will be, you know, we, we will use less energy overall because we won't need to, to recycle them and to transfer them back into another product. Optimization is, is really about um, reducing the amount of material that goes into something, again, reducing the energy, therefore, um, making things cleverer than, than they could be in terms of form or anything else. And, and to give you an idea within our work where we do that, um, you could have a look at the digital design webinar that my colleagues Ben and Sam did the other day, um, where they talked a lot about exactly that, you know, optimizing buildings, geometry and, and form to, for the benefit of everything, the resources. So looping, again, talking about keeping things in the system, keep them, keep them turning over, it's um, really important. Virtualizing, so, oh, sorry, it's not even a verb, Virtu virtualize. So um, this is really about trying to do away with physical objects and turn everything on, um, make everything as, as online as possible. So partly because that reduces physical resources, which is a good thing, but it also gives a certain longevity. So um, we'll touch on this a bit more later, but. For example, when you've got a BIM model and you've got all of that kind of as-built data in there, it's quite nice to try and retain that in an electronic form because it's much more accessible later on to, to understand how you might dismantle something or, or how you might alter it later. And exchange. Exchange is really about trying to change the way we do things, change the technology that we're using. So uh, rapid prototyping is often um, touted as an as a, as a important exchange mechanism. Um, and there's, there's also plenty of other things, other ways that we might change of doing things. For example, how we, how we procure facades, we might, we might want to think about that, whether we want to, to sell a product and hand it over, or whether it may, might make more sense to lease it over time. So kind of that's, that's fairly conceptual, all of those things. So trying to put that into the world of facades, um, we kind of tried to map out on a facade you know, what exactly happens. And you can see that we, Typically, we tend to extract raw material from, from the ground. We then go through this kind of make process of um, processing, putting, assembling things, shipping it to site, and then installing it. Then we have the use of the building, which can vary. Um, you know, it can be anything from, from a few years sometimes to, um, to multiple decades. Um, you know, very often in, in London, where you're, you know, there's been a certain amount of turnover in the last few years, you know, within a sort of 30, 30, 40 year time frame. And then it gets to the end, very typically we, we demolish it. So with very little care, we, we sort of um, take it into small pieces. And then you know, traditionally in the extreme model, um, we landfill it you know, and we just put it in the ground, we forget about it and we move on to the next bit. We, we get the new raw materials and we, we go through the cycle again. Now, obviously the first thing that we want to try and tackle with this as a concept is is reducing the landfill so we kind of okay we need to reduce the landfill and and in kind of current terminology um this is land uh, waste that comes from construction sites is called construction and demolition waste and it's split up into hazardous and non-hazardous and, and here we're focusing on non-hazardous so um so, so that's what it's called um and then in order to do that we actually need to stop demolishing stuff and ripping it apart. And we actually need to be able to dismantle it and pull it apart quite surgically and be able to separate it out into all the different things that, that we have. There's a, been a certain amount of work done on that already, which we'll go into later, but, but perhaps not necessarily with facade components or certainly certain, com certain components that we have. And then once you dismantle, then you can really look to recycle. And, and, and when we say recycle, we mean keeping its intrinsic value as high as possible. So Ideally, not turning it into a, um, a sub base under a pavement or glass bottles, which is considered a lower grade, but actually retaining it as a structural material um, and, and, a, and a visually, visually um, beautiful material. And then, if we do that, then we can then we can reduce the amount of raw material that we're extracting. So this is quite a virtuous cycle. And, and over time, the idea is that we we reduce our dependency on landfill. Uh, sorry, reduce our dependency on on extracting more raw materials because we're managing to get to get it all back through the system with um, with the same quality level, you know, the same intrinsic value. But again, as I said, that does imply that we have to use quite a lot of energy to do that. So um, 
So yeah, I, I don't want to touch too much on energy because I'm aware that uh, Damien's talked about that already. So um, perhaps if you want to know more about the energy side of this, then you could look at the net net zero um, buildings webinar that uh, that he did the other day. Um, he talked a lot more about energy than I can. So all of this is lovely on this diagram, and it's all in the physical realm. You know, this is all looking at the actual objects, but in order to do that, in order to enable a circular economy, in you know, behind the scenes in design terms, we've actually got quite a lot to do. And, and one very basic shift that we could take is to start looking at, um, at how we could consider buildings as material banks. So rather than considering them as buildings that we use, actually they're just they're just there to store materials for a bit while we're using them in a sensible way. But they're not to be thrown away at the end. They're just being stored, and they have a value at the end, and then they can be resold to the market, reprocessed, and turned into something else that's, that's useful for the current age. And in order to do that, we need to think about the materiality that we're, we're, we're putting in, um, and start to really concern ourselves with kind of toxicity. So, you know, how healthy are these materials? A, while we use them, that's important on its own. But of course, when we get to the end, we don't want to have a material that's toxic and is very difficult to recycle. We want it to be as, um, as beneficial for the environment as possible. So it's something to consider. And we also uh, would benefit, I think, from, from really aligning the durability of components um, so that they all kind of have roughly the same lifespan. Um, at the moment, we, we tend to find that we have, say, in the curtain walling system, we have aluminium mullions and transoms that are anodized. They could last in excess of 80 years, possibly, well, quite probably a lot longer. And then in, in that, we put in a, a glass unit, which has an has a expected service life of about 25 years. Um, and that's, that can be quite a problem because, you know, by the time you've taken off the glass, very often the tendency is to also take off the curtain walling system because the gaskets are also um, in trouble, especially the act of taking off the glass and, and the like. So, so there's this kind of tendency that we're having products that are either have too long a lifespan, maybe, or maybe we have products that have too short a lifespan. And it, it's certainly more interesting to increase the durability of products because it means we use less energy in the, in the immediate term. And of course, if we are making stuff last longer, we also need to be a lot more thoughtful about resilience, um, which is another you know, uh, hot topic at the moment. And that's, that's really about just looking ahead and thinking, okay, if we're gonna make our, our facade last for 50 years, for 100 years, what kind of weather events are it going to see? We, we're aware that climate change is, is affecting how things are, and we really do need to be planning about that and coming up with a coherent framework that helps us to design for that um, as a, you know, in a consistent way across the whole industry. So this is always an exciting topic, legislation. Um, this was a tough one. Um, so uh, there's a couple of key European um, directives that, that came about um, so 2008 um, is probably the most interesting one. So 2008-98 EC um, was really the, the primary thing it was trying to do was reduce reduce the amount of construction and demolition waste going into landfill, quite simply. And I think at the time there wasn't even much measuring or monitoring going on as to how much or what proportion was being recovered. And so they set the target that by 2020, um, the whole of Europe needed to manage to get 70% of its um, CDW uh, recycled, so recovered, right? important difference, recovered. So fine, um, that's done by, by weight, so it's not done by value, it's not done by volume, it's done by weight. And when you look at the actual figures, you'll see that um, certainly the UK has been hitting 91% since about 2010, 2011. And it's been very consistent across that time. It's always been 91% plus or minus half a percentage over that entire time, which we can think is great. We've nailed it. We were ahead of time. Fantastic. It also implies that there's a lot more we could do if we were putting the effort in. And clearly, there's a certain amount of inertia there that it hasn't changed. It hasn't really improved much. And I think that really comes about because there was a lot of effort um, put in by the more heavy industries, if you will, um, dealing with aggregates, um, concrete and the like. They put in a lot of work, um, you know, a decade, a decade or two ago and really did improve how they reused materials. Um, and there are other parts of the industry that because they were such a small percentage and because they were quite complicated to dismantle, they've kind of they've never really had the attention that, that they might need in order to make them more sustainable and, and 
kind of head them towards a circular economy model. And, and glass is a is a obvious obvious choice there because the way that glass is, is put together in, in insulated glass units is really quite complicated to dismantle. Um, and and the you know the actual the actual weight of the glass, and if you look at the whole piece, is, is very, very small. It's something it's under one percent of all CDW is glass. But even that is quite a big number, right? I think in the world there's I think every year one million tons of glass um, as part of, of waste, waste from building. And there's also a lot of support that's provided by Europe. Um, so Horizon 2020, um, some of you may be aware of, that's, that's been quite a big initiative actually across the board of research and innovation, but it's been used for, um, for funding a number of um, projects looking at the circular economy. And um, although it, it's, it's supposed to run from 2014 to 2020, um, as far as I can see, and I, I might be wrong, so I'm happy for someone to correct me, I can't actually see what the next thing is after Horizon 2020. But they, they are still releasing funding, they are still calling for projects, so it's, it's, uh, it might be an interesting thing to go and look at. There's also been, um, from 2015, a circular economy action plan, which kind of has 54 actions, um, which apparently Europe as a whole is all doing terribly well, so, um, so that's good news. Um, again, it makes me wonder whether, whether it's quite challenging enough or whether we need to, um, to think, oh, maybe, maybe it's fine, maybe, we, maybe we're doing enough. Um, I'm not entirely sure that's true. So um, we need to talk about glass more than anything, actually. Um, so if you look at all the different materials that are that are put into um, into waste, um, see, uh, you know, construction, demolition waste, glass, I think, is one of the last ones where you know the recycling rate is quite low. Um, so, so yeah, and I think um, really. Uh, so the amount of recycled content that goes into float glass is somewhere between 30 and 40 percent, depending on where you are in Europe. And that's that's for a few good reasons, actually. It's not least because we've kind of developed the technology over time. We've, we've made more uh, clearer and clearer glass over time. So the glass that we produced, say, 25, 30 years ago, which is you know, some of the buildings that we're now dismantling, the, the kind of iron content in that glass was much higher than it is today. And so to try and reinsert that higher iron content glass can be very damaging for the process and, and, and it, can, it can cause problems with the quality level. Optical quality, not structural quality necessarily, but, but optical quality. And so that's, that's a real challenge and there's a, really a question, should, should we, maybe we should increase the iron content of glass again on some float lines in order to actually use that glass again, or maybe we need to come up with another way of reducing the iron from, from existing colors. Um, and there's also body tinted glass and, and other other kinds of glass that were used um, you know, uh, a while ago, quite popularly before coatings became prevalent and successful in, um, in, in preventing solar control and in, in managing solar control. And so there's, there's a lot of this kind of glass that can contaminate the process that, that needs careful consideration. Of course, we of all people, I think, um, are great proponents of laminating glass um, for safety and for structural reasons. Um, but this also causes another problem because it's yet another material and it's a composite material. So you're, you're kind of bonding the glass and the laminate together. And that's, um, that can be quite challenging to get, to get recycled because trying to decouple the glass and the laminate can be very complicated. Traditionally, this has been done by, by grinding up the glass and the laminate together and then separating them, which is a, not the best process in the world. Uh, and again, quite energy intensive and not, not fully successful. But there's been recently some, some projects done where they've, um, they've looked at how they can heat up the glass and then, and then delaminate um, by pulling, you know, heating up the glass to a certain extent and then pulling, pulling pliers apart so that the, um, the PVB interlayer or the entry glass interlayer um, can be then peeled off um, with minimal effort. Um, so that's, that's very encouraging. Um, that's a company called DLAM in, in Australia um, that are doing that. And then the, the more complicated part is uh, insulating glass units. So insulating glass units are made up of, of many components, actually. Um, some of them liquid applied uh, in order to create the hermetic seal and the, and the, structural, the structural bonding of the glass pliers together. And that, that can cause quite a few problems in the dismantling phase because it, it is very labor intensive to actually remove all of that material. And, and what's more, if you don't remove all of that material, then again, you get more contamination going into the float lines, which can, which can cause really big um, quality 
quality issues of the glass that comes out. And, and float lines you know, run 24-7. They produce many, many miles of glass every day. Um, so if you have a contamination problem, um, it might last for three days before it's actually finally cleared your line, at which point you've lost an awful lot of glass, an awful lot of value from your process. It, it's something that's, from, from, a, from a float line point of view, it's, it's something very risky to do is to, to push your luck with, um, with what you're putting into your, what color you're putting into your float line. Yeah, here you can see here you can see the liquid applies structural silicon, um, which bonds the bonds the glass panels together. It, it you know it's it's possible to decouple this later, um, but it's it's very intensive. So in order to get low hanging fruits, um, there's been there's been some interesting work done in looking at how you can recover the majority of glass in IGUs, um, and and this is a, a machine that's working um, in morning, and. Um, and yeah, it, it's, it's not terribly complicated. It's not terribly sophisticated. You put the glass in, um, the machine smashes it up into small pieces and it, and it gets taken up here and, and transferred into a, into a um, bag for, for sending back to a float line producer. Um, there's, there's, there's concern with these from certain, certain um, float, float providers that um, they can get extra contaminants in here through the actual machine. You know, you can get metal particles and other stuff, which can then provoke other problems like nickel sulfide failures um, you know, further down the line, which um, is something the industry is actually trying to be get, get rid of, is, is nickel sulfide um, uh, contamination in float lines, which is kind of naturally, pro um, naturally present anyway. So um, yes, it, it's, it's yet another risk that, um, that people face when they're looking to recycle glass. So I wanted to touch briefly uh, on a project that we're working on at the moment, um, just to, to go sideways from glass for a little bit. And here, this is a really nice building. Probably everyone knows it. It's uh, next to the National Theatre on the South Bank. And here it's quite exciting because we're we're looking to um, we're looking to retain as much of the fabric as we can um, for, for various reasons. Part of it, obviously, for a um, to, to achieve circular economy principles as best as possible. But also for heritage reasons here, because this is quite historically this is quite an important building. So probably the biggest impact is that we're looking to move these concrete bands up by 500 millimeters, um, which sounds terribly simple. It's not so simple, it turns out, but we'll get there. We're also looking at um, moving the, the curtain boarding that goes around the perimeter, um, not by far, but of course, once you've moved something, it doesn't really matter if it's 200 mil or, or two miles, it's the same level of problem. Um, obviously, we're also looking to replace the glass. So, you know, all the things that I've talked about with glass recycling are, are very relevant for this project as well, because we'll have a fair bit of glass that we're taking off the building that we want to try and secure for a, uh, a positive future for it. So, yeah, so here you can see the benefits of, of rising these, um, these concrete panels. Um, we're getting much better daylight into the building um, and also enhancing the quality of space in the terraces. So it's an important thing that's being done and it's important that we try and try and keep it um, that we that we try and retain these panels um, because there's a fair amount of embodied carbon in them um, and a fair bit of material in them. And we're very lucky with this building because it, it, was, um, it was designed by Arab back in the day. And whoever has as the building's been handed over, they've also handed over all the as-built information, and it's very high quality as-built information. You can see here all the cover on the uh, cover to the reinforcements. You can see the grade of the, um, the concrete down in the bottom left. Um, you can see all the rebar and you know, with all the schedules and everything else. Of course, what it does tell you also, you can see it in the central piece, um, if you can see my cursor, um, there is a, it's a shear link. So this, this concrete is actually cast into the, um, the concrete frame. So although it's a precast unit, it was actually cast into the main in situ concrete frame, which makes it quite a challenge to take out, I guess. Um, you know, with the best will in the world. But yeah, so, so thinking of as-built information, you know, we're lucky on this project because it's a very prestigious project and a very cared for building. But I'm sure we've all found that some buildings, when we go back to them, um, they may not have the same level of information about their existing construction. And, and that's actually quite a big problem. And it takes quite a lot of um, effort from, from a designer's point of view to try and understand what's there. 
but it also reduces your chances of being able to reuse or recycle components because you don't really know what the quality is and you don't know what the, you know you don't you don't really understand how it goes together you can deduce and you can start ripping it apart to kind of kind of tell but that's that's not a terribly effective way of doing it is it so so there is, there's a certain amount of talk going on about the idea of embedding construction information into panels. So you know, with the um, RFID technology, uh, there's, a, there's a possibility that you could put, without any need for a power source, you could actually implant data about that product into it so that in the future, someone can come back and, and can actually um, can assess that. So yeah, and so, so going on to our problem, um, you know, we're looking at how we can actually remove, for a start, successfully these panels, but also how we can put them back on in a way that's um, that's as uh, energy efficient as possible. And we've been um, you know, looking at different schemes. It's quite surprising how many how much difference you actually get in embodied carbon between the different options that we've been looking at. Um, you know, so you're getting 21 um, kilograms per meter cubed there, and, and then up to 83. And, and we actually looked at okay, if we made new panels. What, you know, what, what's the embodied carbon of that? And it was something around 120 um, kilograms per meter cubed. And so you can see, it, even when you're, even if you're taking it off and moving it up a little bit, it's actually having, it's actually taking a lot of energy just to do that. Even though you're not remaking it, you're actually reusing it, which is really as good as it can get in circular economy terms. The other challenge with this, actually, beyond having the information that you need, beyond about the embodied carbon, which, as I was suggesting, it, it circular economy requires energy, right? So it's, it's kind of that's, that's just a thing. Um, what we need to target is decarbonizing the energy. But the other part of this is thinking about the warranty, you know, the design warranty on these products. So as you as you go to a building, you say, okay, we're going to move this up by 500 millimeters. In the end, that as, as all the engineers on the team um, assure me that this building is really old. Um, it was built in the same year that I was born, so I, I do take exception to that. But, um, but despite so, it, it's really old, clearly. Um, what it means is it's been out on the Thames for you know for quite a few years, quite a few decades. You've got to assure yourself as an engineer. You've got to assure yourself that it's in a good enough state that you can say, you know what, yeah, this is this is good. This is going to be fine for another thirty years, fifty years, hundred years. And there's a certain question in here that, that is difficult to answer, and I haven't got an answer, but it's, it's really about what, what efforts do you have to make or how far do you need to go to assure yourself that this, is a, this, is a, this panel is secure in terms of intrusive investigations or, or non-intrusive investigations to be able to put hand on heart and say, you know what, yes, this is an old panel, but it's fine, it's going to be okay, it's going to work. It's, it's yet another barrier to this kind of concept, the circular economy concept, um, so, you know, ideally reusing, recycling where you have to. Recycling feels a bit more comfortable because you're going back, it's being processed, you're getting the chance to, to make it new again. Reusing is a much trickier concept and, and, and you know, it's, it's quite a challenge. So, um, so I'm going to try and put all of that together in a, in a coherent way. Um, as I said, there's a, there's a certain argument that we should be considering our buildings as material banks. So we should be storing materials in our buildings, not not just putting them there and then and then throwing them away afterwards. As I was touching on in, in kind of as built data and as built information, it's it's a really clever idea to try and put material passports on products and actually have them embedded into the product so that there's, there's never a, um, a discussion about what's there. Of course, that needs a certain amount of agreement and standardization in terms of how that information is recorded and how it's accessed and, and also how it's how it's accessed over time because as you know, if we went back um, to the kind of you know, go back to the early '80s, well, it was floppy disks, maybe cassette tapes. Um, you know, we don't now well, to find the technology to actually read that is actually quite difficult. So we need to think about the future proofing of technology, or at least the backward compatibility as we move forwards. If if we do go down that route, taking toxicity out of materials important for health, important for future. Um, yeah, something something that's very close to my heart. Making stuff last longer, um, and, and trying to align align the um, align the durability of components, so you're not having to take off one component, and then while you're there, you might as well take everything else off. Um, it's that's that's really quite important. 
And again, just thinking in resilience terms, we, we need to be looking ahead. We really need to understand if, we, if we're going to make FSRs last that much longer, we really need to have a good clue and use the best intelligence to determine what, what we should be designing for, because at the moment we're not. And then beyond that, we also need to think about how we design for disassembly and how we document that, perhaps more importantly, because you can design for disassembly, but if no one knows how to disassemble it, it's pretty useless. So that's also something to bear in mind. And perhaps most importantly, just maintaining the intrinsic value of, of materials, not downcycling stuff, but keeping it at its value, properly recycling it. And again, it's really helpful if we, if we, if we can act with resolve those levers that we talked about earlier, um, that will help us get there for sure. Um, and I, I highly recommend, I'll, I was hoping to upload some links to be honest with this, but um, it hasn't quite worked. So what we'll do is on the, on the website, when we, when we have the watch back, um, we'll put a series of um, links for you to follow if you're interested and you can kind of dig into this stuff a bit further as you want, as you want to. So, so all of these things we've discussed, there's a series of challenges. Um, so yeah, so no established mechanism really in place at the moment to, to incentivize design and, and documenting for this disassembly. Um, resilience, we need a codified approach. We need to, we need to get ourselves together and, and really understand what that needs to look like. Um, there's, yeah, there's a, there's a kind of a semantics thing between recovery and recycling because sometimes recycling um, is celebrated. Um, but actually, it's downcycling. An example is when we take glass and we actually turn it into to subbase for pavement. That's, that's, that's not the same value. And we, it's good that we're using the products and it's good that we're not landfilling them. Don't get me wrong. But we shouldn't over celebrate that. We should also try and push ourselves harder and try and get it back at the same quality level that we put it in, or that, sorry, that we took it out of. And I think something that I found, and, and I, I, I put this to, to myself as well. Um, our mindset, you know, we're so embedded in the linear model. Um, I think we, we all need to occasionally notice that of ourselves and just step back and think, oh, hang on a sec, how can this be used for the next thing? You know, just, just asking ourselves that question, I think will make quite a dramatic difference as to how we act. And we also need to understand that when we, when we try and take on these new issues and we try and act in, you know, with the best of intentions, we are going to start conflicting with other drivers, other design drivers, um, other other pools. So um, I think for me, an example from the other day is, was a design team meeting where we had um, looking at a big tower in London. We need to have lots of daylight into the um, into the lower floors because there's another tower next to it which is blocking the light. We um, we need to have less glazing because we need to have a good U value. So we need to you know. Keep, um, keep the temperature differential between inside and out at the, at the right level without you know, needing to air condition lots or heat lots. Um, we also now need to think about, so those, those are just pulling against each other directly. Um, there's a desire to make the building delightful and, and to, to, to have a, a, a nice space for the occupants to enjoy. And now we're, you know, we have a bunch of other things, you know, fire issues, uh, acoustic issues, all this other stuff. And now we're yet again introducing something else, which is now the kind of the circular economy issues. And how can we how can we future proof what we're doing and, and really work hard at it? So we have a lot of things that pull against each other these days. Um, in my opinion, more than more than I remember when I started, but maybe that's just because as, as you get as you move on, you, you you notice more things and you worry about more things. But I do I do commend um, <laughs> inevitably commend um, Hugh's webinar um, where he talked about the specialist generalist. Um, where uh, um, both of us have, and, and, and Damien, the director of our, of our team, we've talked a lot about this idea where we really do need a central, a central person, a, a technical body that, that can help synthesize all of this and work successfully with other members of the design team, um, which is the architect, the surveyors, and um, the client, to, to really get the best solution and try and synthesize all these different drivers and come up with the best, the best solution for that, for that particular problem. That's not an easy thing, I think. So, uh, very briefly, next steps. I think, um, for me, uh, informing ourselves, educating ourselves, and then trying to inform and educate others is really important. We just, we just need to talk about this a lot more. We, I don't think we talk about circular economy enough. We need to create and support inclusive dialogues. And, and when I say inclusive, I'm, I'm talking about um, across the board, um, making sure that we're talking to other disciplines, other design professionals, 
um, developers, everyone. We all need to be part of this conversation to bring it to success. And we also need to invest. So we need to be looking, we need to be pushing ourselves, we need to be doing research and innovation projects where we can. And you know, there's funding out there, so we should be using that and trying to come up with ways of, of making our practices better. So um, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I, hope, I hope that was helpful. That was really helpful. Um, you've kind of ended on a very pertinent note. Um, the Climate Friday slide that we've got there. Um, very recently, one of our directors, um, our facade director, Damien Rogan, wrote a piece um, for our Climate Friday series on the circular economy facades. So I've just put that up as a handout um, over there. And we're just, we're just going to upload the, um, uh, the, the other Climate Friday piece that Simon wrote on the recycling of glass. Um, so we'll do that before the end of the presentation. But I mean, it's a really interesting uh, topic, Simon. I mean, touched on so many different things, kind of um, all of the reuse issues that come kind of with reusing of materials. You know, you, you know, you said you didn't have an answer to the fact that, um, you know, when you reuse, how do you convince yourself? And I suppose that ties in quite a lot to the insurance issue of how you get insurance for a building and how that goes forward. And then you've got um, things like the financial aspects and the implications of it for the procurement. Um, do you think there could be some kind of actual financial benefit to clients in terms of when they reuse things? You know, just as you can get now a refurbished phone, you could actually get a refurbished facade, which might um, lower the overall cost of facades. I mean, do you think that that's something which you know could be um, uh, could be implemented? Yeah. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Um... Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question. Um, I think it is. I think um, so far there's been a certain stigma against, you know, um, reused, recycled products. I think that is changing over time, um, and I think there's a there's a greater value actually placed on that, um, not least by the market. Actually, I think the market is driving a lot of this stuff, even more than regulation is, and that's a really positive thing. So I think, I think you're right. It will. Um, I think. The sense of value of a, of a recycled refurbished facade will go up over time and it and will actually be a desirable thing to have and, and something that you can sell to potential potential um uh tenants for your building um and i think um sorry i had another thought but it's <laughs> maybe that maybe that we mentioned there. legislation i mean um legislation is always kind of a hot topic in terms of um, construction and things like that but um, and you said the marketplace is actually driving it, which is quite interesting because sometimes it kind of you need that step change in legislation to be able to kind of input it through to your market and actually get the, the evenness across the board to be able to implement that. And so what, um, yes, you know, yeah. what, what would you like to see in terms of legislation? You know, kind of what would you like to see the government actually doing to kind of make these changes possible? Yes, well, um, I think it's. You know, it's rather curious, and this is why I pointed out that you know the legislation has insisted that we have seventy percent recovery from our construction waste, and we've been we've been hitting ninety one percent for years. Um, it's clearly it's, that's not what's driving it. You know, it's not the legislation part. I think um, there has been a lot of policy work been going on in the last five years or so, which I'm sure will then translate into legislation over time. Um, and of course, again, I, the trouble is this is such a broad topic, and we've I've. In, in order to fill the limited time we had, I, I've touched on materials only, but circular economy is actually a much bigger concept, a much bigger conversation. Um, and I've missed off a lot of parts that are, that are much more interesting, well, much more interesting, that are, that are, um, that are yeah. very exciting as well, let's put it that way. Um, so in terms of what, what do we want from government? Well, we're seeing generally that the market is driving an awful lot of change in the, in the world of sustainability. It's, it's really being driven a lot by the market, and, and that's why... A lot of developers are pushing us much harder now to come up with sustainable schemes and you know we're providing much better quality of information to make clever decisions in terms of embodied energy and you know, embodied carbon and the like. Um, inevitably it, it's important really that the government, what the government could do that would be truly useful is to, to make products cost what they actually cost, including the environmental cost, including the cost to the earth. Um, because at the moment we underpay for all of our materials. 
because because they're not um, because we don't need to pay for the consequences of throwing them away at the end yet. Um, so I think the most useful thing would be to encourage the market to value materials at their actual value, not at what we can get away with, which is what we do at the moment. In a short term, um, I'll take a couple of questions from um, from the kind of the audience, as it were. Um, so Ben has said, "What role?" Isn't this slightly um, well? I, I, yeah, well, alarming question, I suppose. But what role does a designer um, just out of grad school have in the circular economies? He says that from his personal experience, the project managers in, um, let's just say, Anna on an architecture firm, um, no names mentioned, uh, don't seem to have as much interest in forward thinking and sustainable ideas as long as the project comes from under budget, is under budget, and status quo is good enough. Kind of. Um, what, so what role does the designer, you know, kind of a young designer have? How can they change kind of the things going forward? Hmm. That's, a, that's a really good question um, and, a, and a difficult one at that. Mm. Um, I think the first thing is don't give up. Um, it, it would be quite easy to become disillusioned when you're in that circumstance, I think. And, um, and the important thing is to keep going and to keep talking about it, to keep bringing up the conversation, um, to have faith that in the end the market will drive um, a lot of these questions and, and firms and practices that do not that are not looking at this now will be in, in a very difficult situation in, in not that many years time because they won't have the right skills or understanding to really to really meet the, the modern requirements that we need to get to um, yeah in, inevitably as a, as, a, as a more junior member of staff it's very difficult to be listened to sometimes um, you of course have you have agency in that you can choose where you work to a certain extent. Um, and yes, I think mostly I would just don't stop talking about it. Just keep talking about it. Um, it'll be very tiring um, to have everyone not understanding and not listening. But if you keep talking about it, they will listen in the end. Yeah. And the market will drive them there. Yeah, they're. absolutely. I mean, the, the, the current trends at the moment are such that everybody has to make a move towards sustainability. And let's hope that that kind of pushes the market into kind of doing something about it. But um, so Bina asks, have you calculated savings from offsetting due to investing a bit more upfront um, for a project man project programming, sorry, for example, that allows for design for disassembly so that it's used as a selling point to clients? Um, do you have other economic incentives as examples? So it's kind of touching on kind of what I was asking about before about the kind of the economic um, and the kind of financial um, rewards, I suppose, that we can kind of use as a carrot in front of people's noses to kind of um, get it going. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, and, and, and we, we certainly talk about embodied carbon in order you know, to, to explain what the differences are between different solutions and have that as part of the mix of what we consider as well as cost, um, direct cost. Um, the, yeah, the notion of, of looking at design for disassembly and saying, right, this is the difference between being short Absolutely. If that's the appropriate thing to do, um, then, then absolutely, that's that's a calculation that that we do make. Um, on the projects that I've been working on recently, I haven't I haven't got an example of that. But it, we are constantly analysing and presenting the differences um, in embodied carbon terms, um, in financial terms, in quality terms, and and yeah, we would absolutely include dismantling, you know, dis designing for disassembly as part of that part of that set of. Of really trying to make or helping people make informed choices as to how they want to have their building, mm. and and increasingly, um, you know, this is this is particularly helpful conversation to have with people, you know, owner occupiers who are going to be holding on to their building and, and want it to have an intrinsic value at the end. You know, that, that's a it's a really it's a really valuable conversation to have. Very yeah, much. very much so. It's um, you kind of got to make it their incentive, don't you? It's kind of um, it's almost like convincing them it's their idea to take it up, I suppose. Um, Absolutely, and and you have to empathise with clients. You know, they we all have our own set mm -hmm. of problems. Um, you know, they're, they're doing this. They're not doing it for for purely um, um, altruistic reasons. You know, it, there's there's a there's a broader picture here, and we have to answer to that. Otherwise, no one's yeah. going to do it. Well, I mean, so we do have to work within those. Yeah, constraints. especially at the moment. You know, kind of the market will change completely, and it's kind of it's very difficult to predict. I suppose from one year to the next, what's going to happen. So. Um, yeah, it's, and it's over such a large number of years, I suppose, as well, which just kind of makes it difficult to prepare for the future. Um, 
it's it's the biggest challenge is the time yeah. scale on these things that we're talking about. Yeah, but materials yeah. change, I suppose, as well in terms of the the uses of those particular materials that people used 30 years ago. So um, I suppose Richard's made a bit of a comment on that in terms of um, suggesting that the construction industry, um, you know, kind of learning from what they've been doing in the automotive industry, kind of in terms of reconditioning things. Um, so that's kind of a bit of a comment mm. on that one. Mm. Um, yes, and, that's, and that was largely legislation driven, actually. So they were, they were um, I think, a while ago, they had to hit 85% um, recycled content cars, um, which they achieved, of course, because they had to. So, um, so that is a good, a good um, show of what legislation can do. In the yeah. Market. What? Um, who are the kind of um, influential players in kind of in this um, in this kind of movement, if you like? But apart from other, us, obviously, obviously we're one of the movers and shakers. But um, you know, who are the influential players? If people want to kind of go and um, and kind of read more and kind of learn more. Um, hmm. You know, who are the kind of the, um, the influential players? Yeah. So um, yeah, as I said earlier, uh, really keen to put on a series of links on the website mm -hmm. um, when we when we post this um, watch back webinar, um, because yeah, there's, there's plenty of sources. Um, so I think main players uh, in terms of well, if you if you start off with the, the circular economy as a whole piece, um, you know, Ellen, Ellen MacArthur Foundation really doing a lot of work in this area, a lot, um, and really being very vocal about it as well, most importantly. So they have a wealth of documents, uh, a wealth of tools that can really help all of us um, kind of uh, find our way towards a more circular economy. Um, and, and then beyond that, there's um, the Knowledge Transfer Network have done, done some good work, um, also pulling people together. So there was a project a few years ago by Arab and um, Brennan Reifer. Where they looked at and they actually dismantled a facade and they, they really dug into what it meant and what could be recycled what could be reused and there's a report on that which will be included in the links um and you know arab arab do a lot of work with macarthur um at the macarthur foundation um, because they're one of the knowledge partners so they they do quite a lot of work in circular economy also regenerative design which is something we haven't really talked on today which is a yeah really interesting topic um but good time um so yeah, those are probably the obvious, the obvious people that have been, been working in this area vocally. Um, but I think a lot of people have been working in this area. And I think this is why I was kind of saying we need to, we need to have inclusive dialogues. We need to have inclusive dialogues between all of us. Um, and that, my feeling is, is that uh, our institutions could do a great job of doing that. You know, an institution to institution, kind of reaching this kind of cross-disciplinary collaboration to really make sure we're talking to each other and creating those platforms for the rest of us to populate. Because there's an awful lot of energy, an awful lot of desire to do this. It's, it's really, sometimes you kind of stand and you okay, where can I get involved? So, so I think we really need to create those, those places, those, um, those platforms for people to, to come together and, and put a big flag there saying, this is where it is. Come over here and let's talk about this. Um, and on that note, if anyone wants to come talk to me about it, please come and talk to me about it. <laughs> Um, you know, our whole facades department are kind of open for the discussion of this. Um, Tanya has asked, um, do you think that one of the main barriers to implementation of kind of refurbished facades has to do with the current business model from manufacturers and contractors? You know, kind of maybe they think that if those components are reused constantly, then they don't have a place for doing business anymore. You know, kind of what, what, uh, you know, what yeah. kind of what's the place for manufacturers and contractors? if this kind of circular economy of facades actually comes into place? Yeah, no, a really good question again. The, um, so yeah, design for obsolescence. So if we're reusing materials, so if we take this at face, the basic value, if we're just reusing materials, so rather than throwing them away, we're, we're, we're reprocessing them. That actually involves more energy and more effort. So actually it's probably on the side of job creation, if I'm honest. Um, so that's something to bear in mind. If you're increasing the longevity of your components, then yeah, then, then there's, there's that, that valid question, which is, hang on a sec, they're, they, they're not going to replace it as often, so, so what's that all about? But of course, probably in order to increase the lifespan of, of objects and components, we're probably going to need to maintain them a lot more. So, so there's actually a certain amount of work in that as well, and, and revisiting things, and of course upgrading things, because if we make them last for 100 years, um, you know, think of what's happened in the last hundred years in terms of facade technology. Um, 
you know, we would be, if you, if you were to retain it, you would really want to keep going back and refitting it and, and, and have thought about refitting it when you put it together in the first place. So, so you can think up front, you can get everything lined up, and, and actually you, you, will, you don't need to say, well, we're just going to put it there and leave it there forever and, and never touch it again. There's actually a need to go back. The key difference is that we're not ripping it off and throwing it in the bin and do it, doing it again. That's, it doesn't imply that you have less effort, less work, um, in fact, probably quite a lot more. And this is why Europe is looking at this at a policy level quite seriously, because it's seen as a big job creation. Yeah. And, and an economic yeah, driver. absolutely. And um, I suppose on that note, um, Tanya has said, um, which is a little kind of, it's, it's food for thought, I suppose. She said, you know, it's a really interesting topic and certainly something to think about. Um, and it sounds like extremely high quality buildings. Um, she says that today, especially in North America, no one wants to think beyond 20 to 30 year lifespan of a building. And clients and investors should you know, be heavily educated about this building economic approach. So it's kind of, um, it sounds like there's kind of a, a steep learning curve kind of in North America to be had in terms of this whole um, kind of topic of discussion, I suppose. I think not just in North yeah, America. So, yeah. um, we need to have that conversation with ourselves. We need to have a conversation with the people around us. And we need to have the conversation between everyone. Um, yeah, certainly social economy is a huge thing. And it, it's, um, it's certainly a good vehicle to get us towards a properly sustainable yeah. society. Are there any countries which are kind of um, forging the way forward? Or is it kind of all pretty much a broad brush, the same situation? Yeah, so, so it can vary quite a lot, actually, between countries. I haven't got any figures, I'm afraid, to hand. Um, but certainly in Europe, there's been a lot of work done on this in the last seven years or so. Um, the Horizon 2020 program has been really beneficial to kind of create research projects. Um, one particular one, I think RE4 springs to mind, where they've kind of been looking at making panels, sandwich panels that can be, can be stripped apart after 40 years and reassembled again and then returned back. Um, so I think... Europe is doing a lot of good work here. Japan is another one. Um, I think probably Japan above anyone because, because it's a country which is very, very stripped of resources. Um, they've had to be quite innovative and quite clever about you know, what they have. We're using it as much as possible. So if you, if you dig into their figures, you'll find that they have an incredibly high recovery rate and, and also quite a high quality recovery rate. In that. Um, so it does vary. And, and we, can, we can grab the best practices from places like Japan um, and, and keep pushing the conversation forward. Um, one, one last question from Bina. She said, um, various LCA tools and material passporting libraries now gather data. You know, what is the library that we should all refer to and how can we combine this data that's available? I mean, that's such a big topic in terms of having, um, you know, a library that uh, everybody inputs into. It's been a massive topic in kind of geotechnics, you know, kind of how do you combine all of that data together that, um, is a big repository for everybody um, to kind of tap into for the greater good, I suppose. If, is there a way of doing that? Mm. So, um, yeah. Yes, I, I'm not aware of, of, of such a place today. Um, I, I can see absolutely the need for it. And, um, and again, I would, I would suggest that having that institution led it would be an appropriate thing um, as, as we are members of, of those institutions and, and um, they are probably the best collective body to represent us and, and to link together as well. Um, so yeah, so uh, absolutely, I think that's really important. Much indeed, we've come up against our time now. So thank you very much indeed for joining us, everybody. Um, just a very quick one on, um, on our future, hopefully, webinars that are gonna come up, our kind of more international uh, slant, which kind of from seeing all the people kind of popping up on the right-hand side saying, you know, kind of hello from all over the place, it's well needed. So uh, we'll have San Francisco, Paris, Hong Kong, New York, about sculptures, R&D, um, setting up new offices in different places, and all sorts of other things. So tune in, watch out for your emails, have a lovely Wednesday afternoon. Um, and thank you very much for joining us. It's been a fantastic series of events. Um, watch out for this one to be uploaded to the website and with all of those links that Simon was talking about. And um, yeah, great. We hope to hear from you. If you've got anything um, that you want to get in touch with about, um, you can contact myself, Catherine, at eocengineers.com 
or you can get in touch with Simon or any one of the team or the London engineers, um, London at EOC engineers email address down at the bottom of the slide. So great. Have a lovely evening. The sun is shining over here, so I, I hope it is wherever you are. And uh, we'll catch you all soon. Thank you very much indeed, guys. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye.